As you notice, there's not a high-tech intro. We're just gonna jump right into it. This video is about H gear. We're gonna answer some of your questions. We're going to explain to you what we run uh, as we gear up for the CQB house here next week. And we'll talk about some of the older gear that we had for the most part and our upgrades that we're getting ready to switch over to. But before we get started, I would highly recommend you not continue switching your gear time and time again because uh, the market tells you something is the best. It's better for you to stick with what you have, <clears throat> upgrade as you need to, but understand every time we upgrade, it's going to change things slightly, which could potentially hinder your overall capabilities and operations. So um, a lot of the questions I get asked is due to people just being absolutely overwhelmed with what's on the market and what people are telling you they need. So how do we choose armor? For me, there's three key points. First and foremost, the quality of the carrier and belt. For the most part, it needs to be a 1000D Cordura. The stitching needs to be um, really solid, typically double stitched. Uh, most plate carriers now are 1000D. If you're gonna spend like $100 on a carrier, you're probably looking at 500D, which is gonna tear, tear very easily. The second thing I look for, which is probably the most important, does it qualify for all my operational needs? All right, and thirdly, what does a company stand for? Does a company, are they solid? Okay, which there's a lot of great companies out there, a lot of good people working for the companies, but do they tithe? Do they give back to the communities? Do they help? Um, invest in law enforcement training, things of that nature. Those are things that I look for. Uh, you got anything else that you look for? Um, I agree with all those points. One thing that I would add is comfortability for me. I've had some plate carriers that are just, for my body type being skinny and stuff, just rub me raw in some wrong places and some of them really comfortable so it just that's one big thing for me is so that so that is a, a really good point you know we've ran a lot of carriers in the last decade <clears throat> um some carriers feel really good but then you get out there in that heat you start sweating you uh -huh. don't have a barrier between you and the carrier the type of material starts chafing you and itching and it can uh it can definitely take your focus off of operation not only that the some of the more rigid like plate carriers, I've found that when it does heat up and you start sweating, it does, it tends to rub you raw more, like harsher than something that's like a little bit more plia pliable. Yeah. Uh, something else to take in consideration is when anytime you buy new gear, for me personally, there's a break in period to where the gear, uh, the material becomes a little bit more malleable and overall uh, feels a lot better. It conforms to the body better. It's going to, dissipate any sweat yeah uh, rain water anything like that a little bit better but um like i said you and i've ran a lot of carriers over the last decade and the one that you liked the most up to this point was the old prototype for frogman tactical and you were talking about the comfortability of it overall which we're going to show you guys that there's only one in existence this is it right here and he has put it through the ringer. <laughs> that's, that's been my baby. <laughs> that's, I love that thing. Um, so a lot of questions I get asked um, throughout social media and in classes, when and where do you determine you run armor? When and where do you determine what type of gear do you operate in? And for us, um, we had a baseline of gear that we had to have for every operation. There was a certain amount of mags, certain amount of water that they wanted us to have. Uh, each person needed to have so many crashes, a frag or two, things of that and a certain amount of rounds. And that was just bare minimum of what y'all had to bring. Yeah, and anything outside of that was up to you. Okay. Um, so it's interesting that a lot of people think because armor is so prominent on the market right now, even over the last five years, that if you were patrolling in the hills of Afghanistan or something like that, you would be in armor, and that's not true. This is where we wear H harnesses, you're completely exposed. It's just not possible to work in those altitudes with that, um, 
weight of gear and the bulkiness simply based on the fact we're trying to be clandestine, we're trying to go undetected, mm -hmm. and we're not technically under those conditions looking for a gunfight. And you had mentioned you saw many videos where Marines are like patrolling on flatland. Mm -hmm. And typically what they have is they have a convoy that's further back. A lot of times they'll be out doing certain things, but the most common thing that I've seen is they're actually patrolling to receive gunfire so they can actually engage the enemy, which is crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, well, kudos to them. <laughs> yeah, but you gotta understand, they are on flat land. Um, even though they're out all day, they're not up and down hills. And when I say up and down hills, I'm talking hands and knees from sunset to sunrise in the morning. You're talking eight to 10 miles. Very, very dangerous terrain. So I think the, the heaviest I ever was on an operation was my carrier belt and everything is about 65 pounds, a little less, 63 pounds. Really? Was that with a, your bag too? No, the bags, oh. if you were to go do some type of SR or something, bags can weigh anywhere from 65 pounds up to 150, depending on where you're going. And if you're going in the desert, you're naturally gonna take more water. If you're going out in the jungle or places like that where water is more accessible due to the rain, you know, and you have lakes or rivers, springs, so uh, you don't need as much. So overall, you're looking at a little over 100 pounds, typically. You're, you're about three quarters your body weight. You know, and I'm, I'm 190, 195 right now. Like I said, the heaviest I was is about 63 pounds, but you're talking about extra ammo. You're talking about um, crashes, grenades. I carried 14 or 15 magazines total. So I carried double stack, two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 and then two in the rifle, so 14 total. That's not counting the bolt bag that was left in the Humvee, you know, with security while we went in and operated. So based on everything that you've seen me do over season videos and what's happening over there and what we're training for as everyday citizens, civil unrest, maybe active shooter, if that were ever to arise, um, what do you think the major differences are? Unless, like, we're fighting the government or something like that, um, I don't see, you know, civilians getting in prolonged gunfights. Now, us being, you know, preparing for that or that happening, I'd personally say fit as many magazines as you can carry. At least 14. Magazines and water. Magazines, water. <laughs> a little and, bit of food. <laughs> yeah, some pro, like those little chocolate bites or some granola bars or yeah. just some protein that is just, it doesn't gotta taste good. It's just gotta fuel. Fuel you know, the fight. Yeah, fuel the fight. And also I think uh, one of the things, like I said, that we see on the internet is everybody want, they're, they're taking guidance from operational videos and uh, whether they be pictures of Navy SEALs or Green Berets or CAG or whatever. And then you have the marketing aspect where they're pushing these full operators running through these structures kitted out. So they think that's what is needed 100% of the time. And if you think about how heavy you are under those conditions and how fast bullets fly, you're mo more likely gonna die. So minimizing our gear as a citizen is extremely important in, in my experience. I, I would say that no matter, you know, Obviously, being overseas, there's a lot more that you do have to have um, than civilians, but typically, you know, in my opinion, no matter you're civilian or you are overseas operating, you want to try to be as streamlined as possible, like overall, right? Yeah. You know, you don't want to be over too bulky, you don't want to overweight yourself, or, you know, you want to take what you need and obviously have extras of things because one is none and two is one, but take that with a grain of salt 
is like because if you do pack out that extra water that extra ammo you're gonna have to have that extra weight yeah so one of the things we have to realize is as citizens even me is uh, we're probably not going overseas or another country period to go to war unless you choose to do that sign up or ukraine's a good example so the mindset is let's train heavy so we can be get better but we need to be uh, operationally streamlined uh, ukraine and Russia, the conflict right now is a great example. If you look at all the operations that they're patrolling and the trench work, you know, they're very streamlined. They some, a lot of them have armor on, they've got some magazines, a little bit of ammo, maybe a little water, a radio, and that's pretty much it. Um, at the end of the day, when you get into a gunfight, you know, a little bit of medical gear, n nothing else really matters. Some grenades, obviously, as citizens, we don't have access to that. But I wanna really reiterate, for us as civilians that at some point carrying too much kit is most likely going to get you killed you know there's oh, yeah. at the end of the day we want to be streamlined we want to be able to move fast and we want to be able to take action and win the and, fight and then at the end of the day think about it if we were to deal with some civil unrest not only would we potentially be dealing with uh, foreigners coming over blue hats uh, maybe our own military, our own law enforcement, potentially, other agencies that they build. Uh, under those conditions, we're gonna be food restricted, power restricted, they're gonna do communications restricted. So you also are gonna have to understand that you are gonna be fighting many of your neighbors that are wanting to do your harm or take from you. And you have to understand, like, you, Ukraine is a good example but there's a lot of aspects that are happening in Ukraine that we're probably not going to experience here in the States with civil unrest. Like like what? Artillery, for example. Most likely. Um, and I mean, not to say that we wouldn't be digging trenches if it came down to it, 100% we would, but when I think of, you know, America falling and us having to fight here, it's going to be a lot of fast-paced stuff. It's not going to be, you know, in my opinion, what we see in Ukraine of, you know, it's going to be a lot of people like urban environments, cities, stuff like that, like we have seen in Ukraine. But I feel like Ukraine, you see a lot more like what we saw in World War One, World War Two, where it's literally you're taking inch by inch. And right. it, it could get down to that here, too. But Ukraine is so vast in, in open land and stuff like that, which we have here, too. But we I feel we have a much more um, bigger populace overall. Yeah. Like the density wise. So there's a, there's a kind of a catch 22 here. Obviously, if we were to go into some type of civil unrest, um, the goal is to control and not destroy, mm -hmm. although they can rebuild. But the more resistance the American people give, the more aggressive they have to become, which is going to cause more destruction. And eventually we're going to be destroyed, uh, you know, buildings and cities and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I agree that. For some time, they will do everything they can to mitigate, you know, destroying everything. But at some point, you know, it, it is what it is. It's going to happen like every other country because yeah. humans are involved. So for me personally, one of the things you'll notice is I always run as streamlined as possible. You know, you'll see very minimal stuff on my belt. You'll see very minimal stuff on my carriers. And um, that's it. I, I'm a firm believer in... You know, I'm getting older, I can't move as fast, so we have to be a little bit more uh, strict on what we're carrying, you know? So I, I agree with that, but I've always had the mindset of it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. I mean, I carry a gun every day, you know? I may not need the gun, but I carry it just in case I do need the gun. Um, so when it comes down to the essentials, ammo, water, medical, I, I really think that those are the things that need to be priority over other stuff. Like, 100%. If, if I got to choose between water and some other magazines uh, versus like some baby wipes or some socks, I'm taking the magazines and the water. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. and I, you know, one of the things that I find interesting is a lot of people on the internet will say, hi, how you doing? They'll say things like, you should be doing, you should be wearing this and wearing that. And I used to try to, reason with them but I got to a point to where I understood that 
there's a reason why they never went overseas and, and became a protector or anything like that. It's just because it's not in their nature. And when you put on this armor, you are already pretty much signing your death wish. It's just part of the game. You know, the moment you put on any type of armor, you understand that your hips are vulnerable, your thighs, your neck, your face. Well, that, and also when you put on armor, you're saying to the world, here I am, let's go. Like, it's you or me at, at that point. Yeah. I mean, as CCW holders, you, you know, you do take that into account too when you carry a gun, you know, you're not just carrying it to protect yourself, you're carrying, you know, at the end of the day, you, you're carrying, I mean, I won't say everybody, but for me, at the end of the day, I'm carrying my gun so I can protect everybody else around me. Right. You know, if I get hit, I get injured, I, you know, inevitably <clears throat> die trying to protect people, then it is what it is, that's why I'm here. But, like you were saying, you put on armor and you're getting into it, like going close quarters and stuff, yeah, you're saying, here I am, it's you or me. You know, another thing, as a citizen, I hear a lot of these angry people on the internet, even some prior military, they say, you know, you're, you're LARPing, you're pretending. Um, you know, as somebody who's witnessed the way our country is going and the act of shooting and stuff like that, you can only train your children to do so much. And um, I always carry a rifle, my pistol, CCW, holster, and a set of armor, if not my belt and stuff, if I'm going to go train. But those three things are a must, rifle, pistol, and armor. And there was one instance to where it was your school, Midland Freshman, I was actually in Midland, and they gave an emergency call that there was a, uh, someone got in a shootout with law enforcement, they locked the school down, and he was in that area. So I got in my truck, I hauled butt there, I literally sit right across the street from the front doors, and an officer was there, and I just waved at him, and I just sat there for almost two hours, and I ran these things through my head, and the more I thought about it was, even though I could see 100 yards in each direction, um, would I had enough time to don the armor and stop the person from getting inside? Or would I had to just grab the rifle and go and help that law enforcement officer? And a lot of times, like you said, home defense, there were times when I first got out that I would keep my armor right fairly close to the bed until I had a couple incidences and realized, you know, you're not gonna put your armor on. Yes. The moment it happens, they get inside the house, you immediately go towards that threat because you have children in your house. You don't, the goal is I don't wanna search for them. I don't wanna, I wanna find them at my front door. I wanna find them at my back door. I don't wanna find them in somebody's room. So even though you can don gear real quick, it's just driving forward is, you know, first nature. So, you got anything else on that before we start well, digging in? Yeah, I, I do want to swing back to like how you said that you, you've heard law enforcement and some even prior military guys, you know, calling, saying LARPing or like play acting or whatever. My kind of take on that is they're saying that because when they joined, they were allowed in this exclusive club, right, so to speak, where they got all these toys and you know, they got to go be badasses and stuff like that. Well, then now they come home and they see civilians doing the same stuff that they went and signed four or six years of their life away. And it kind of, I honestly think it, it hacks them off and they're, they're uh, what is that? What is the word that we, offended or- Offended? Offended by it because they're like, well, so here, here's, that's a good concept. What you're going to find is a lot of military men, uh, even law enforcement, uh, firefighters, anybody who put their life on the line, who've given part of their life to that, um, they've never moved on. And that's yeah. the best thing that they've ever yeah. done. So that's where the offense comes in at. They're not thinking clearly like me. I 100% understand a majority of the military could not pick up a gun and effectively use it if they had to. Um, it's just all there is to it you know the entire navy they qualified with a laser on the rifle instead of a bunch of connex boxes they never got to shoot any type of you know uh, live rounds or anything like that you're looking at all the administrative people so just because they sign up for the military as admirable as admirable as it is does not mean they're going to go out there and help in a gunfight and for me personally once I got past that and my family became my priority or God and then helping other people, I quickly understood because I became more clear headed that the percentage of fighters 
is very small compared to all the quality shooting citizens out there that would realistically um, keep our country safe. And I, I'll say one more thing. There was a time where somebody made a comment, bring our soldiers back so they can protect us. And that's ticked me off because I'm thinking, you want us to go over there and fight to protect you, be away from my family, and then come back here and protect you and your family? How about you get off your lazy ass and you start being a warrior and protect you know, your family, because when we come back, we're a small percent. There's no way we could fight an internal war. You're gonna have to fight and be on the front so lines. So that's something that I wanted to bring up, and I'm glad you did. Um, I don't know if you recall the Uvalde shooting um, where the law enforcements were just sitting there in the hallway. One was sitting there on his phone, another one went to go get hand sanitizer, which it could have been because he was anticipating to apply medical to somebody. I'm not gonna, you know, I wasn't there. I'm not gonna put anything on anybody and say that they did whatever. Um, but I will say that this is why we have armor. This is why we have guns. This is why we train. Because if that was my kids in there, I'd have gone through anybody to get there. I don't care if it's law enforcement or not. Yeah, they wouldn't have. Either, you wouldn't have stopped me. Either, either you're my to kill friend, me. Either you're my friend or you're my enemy, and you can be on either side. Yep. I will sit in prison for my children, and I can be on the news for my like, children yeah. and wife. Me too. It's just all there is to it. So without getting into that whole nother conversation, let's go ahead and check these uh, plates and uh, carriers out, or excuse me, the plate carriers out, and we'll go from there. Cool. So this is the pro prototype that my dad had designed a couple years, or more than a couple years back, as you can tell. I put it through the ringers. So this is one of the most streamlined and just simplistic carriers that I've ran. Um, some things that I do like about it are the straps right here, the mesh that they have in there and the padding that they have is by far some of the most comfortable I've used. Um, another thing that I do like about this carrier is that I'm able to fit three on my sides and three in the front like we were talking about earlier. I want to carry as much fighting utensils as I can. So you can see on the back, there's not any zippers or anything like that. You just got the molly, but it still allows you to put, you know, a backpack or a camel back or anything like that. And you can still run your drinking hose through these straps to the front. So it's always right, accessible to you. So as they say, out with the old and in with the new, this is my new HRT rack. It's a modular system. And what I mean by that is you can replace this front placard for different options, ones with pistol pouches, uh, all kinds of different stuff. You could also detach this and throw it on an H harness and run it as a Minuteman or chest rig. So as you can see here, I opted just to keep the straps uh, versus the cummerbunds, just personal preference. So as you can see on both the left and right straps, you have smaller straps that we can run our camelback hose or our comms through. On the back of this, I have a backpack and you can see the zippers. So like we said, it's a modular system and just like the front, I could take this off. I can put different styles on there. I could put a camel back um, and so on and so forth. So with this, obviously we can carry extra magazines. We can carry extra medical, uh, water, um, comfort items, things of that nature. All right guys, so this is the carrier that I'm running by HRT Tactical. Um, I also have the rack as Hayden, but this is called the L-Back. This is their new one. And we're just touching some of the uh, concepts that they have. It's very well made. They have quick releases, top and bottom here, so we can get out of it and uh, don it very quickly or ditch it in case we hit water or something like that. Back in, uh, when the Marines came over the beach in Normandy, when they stepped off of the boats, basically they went straight to the bottom. Um, what they didn't account for was the tides were changing the sand berms underneath the water. So when the boats hit the sand berm, they thought they were shallow enough. So the Marines went off, went straight to the bottom. Since they didn't tell or teach the Marines how to get out of their gear very quickly, they panicked and hundreds drowned. So as Hayden said, the entire system is modular. We can disconnect this, we can take this placard off and we can change that placard to anything that HRT has. I'm also running the medical drop pouch. If we come on the side here, you'll see that I am running the cummerbund. Now, 
If you look right here, I do have the ability to place a radio on both sides, or I could run a radio on one side, an extra magazine on the other, or something of that nature. If you come to the back right now, I have this one slick, just like Hayden's, the rack. This one has a zipper to where you can put the modular system on there. But you can also use the Molly and Velcro for Camelback and other things, uh, things of that nature, okay? Really good setup. I'm really excited to start running this. And I'm also running the Juggernaut. Obviously, operational needs are a little bit different than what we're doing. I'm going to be using this for filming in the shoot house. So that way we can get a lot of good feedback. This belt I'm actually building right now, this is a really lightweight and durable belt from um, HRT Tactical. As you can see, I've got my trusty knife on here. They've got their magazine pouches. <clears throat> what I like about the magazine pouches here is they have plastic inserts. If you come on this side, that are pretty durable. So they, when, they, when you put them in there, they're not really going to go anywhere now. The reality is if I'm out there rolling in the hills and stuff, it's possible that they could come out. But for CQB, being on our feet a lot, it's pretty dang sturdy. Same thing, I'm running a medical pouch here on the back. One of the things you're gonna notice is this is called the core. It's like a carbon fiber core. Very durable, very thin, it's comfortable. And they do have the, um, we'll call them a covers that cover the back of this. I chose not to do it because when I get the rest of my stuff in, it's just going to cover it up anyway. And, and personally, I'm very keen on ounces equal pounds. If I can mount this to the core and still be just as operational as this, at the end of the day, this just provides a little bit of extra comfort. Now under this, it has a very thin EDC belt that you wear and you can attach it as well. I really, really like how thin this is. Uh, my personal battle belt that Frogman Tactical has, the EDC belt's a little bit thicker, more rigid, but this is a really good system overall. If we come on this side, I've actually got a couple crashes by IWA attached to here. <clears throat> and we have the gun set up. Now this is a new holster that I just ran across in Brazil. Um, I'm gonna do a video in conjunction with the Safari Land holster that I'm running and show you the difference. Uh, out of all the holsters that I've had the honor of testing out, nothing has held a candle to uh, Safari Land until now. This one has really got my attention. Overall, this is probably one of my favorite carriers that I've ran in my life. <clears throat> I know it can be very overwhelming when you're trying to, like I said, look at the marketing aspect, look what operators run, look what these people you look up to on YouTube run, and try to decide what you need as a, a citizen. And then it complicates it even more when they have a modular system. Um, I'm, I'm big on keeping it very simple. So what I would recommend is you just sit down and make a decision on how many rounds you think you need. And as I believe Hayden said, you know, in all honesty, I want to run at minimum of six. So me, I have two in my rifle. I've got three across, across the chest and most likely two here. If we had an issue here in this country, and we see a lot of guys pushing the ham radios, at the end of the day, the people that we train with for the most part lives hundreds of miles away, potentially in another state. The chances of you linking up are almost non-existent if they start locking down this country. So in my personal opinion, yes, radios are important, but it's also an opportunity to be DF'd by the enemy if they wanted to get down to the nitty gritty. I don't see myself running radios at a high capacity because at the end of the day, again, the only people I trust are the ones that are in my circle. And to be honest with you, regardless of how good someone is, where they've served, what they promise you, you the nature of humans proves that most people can't be trusted. So you have to be very cautious on these things, okay? So anyway, give a HRT Tactical a uh, look. Oh my gosh, this dude's eyebrow, eyelashes just fell off. Holy crap, check that out. No wonder why he looked like a chick. Now he's looking a little more like a man. I feel we're gonna have to we're gonna have to put him on the range. What do you guys think? You think we should fill him up with tannerite and pop him at about a thousand yards and see what's left? 
<laughs> so if you guys have any questions, put it in the comment section. Um, if you have experience with another carrier that you like, put it in the comment section of why, and we'll see you next video. Have a great day and God bless.